Welcome to the Business Summer Series. I'm Elise Morgan. In this program, we'll take a look at tourism, how it's changed over the past 12 months and how it's adapting to the future. Including empty buses, cancellations and travel bans, Australia's multi-billion dollar tourism industry scorched by bushfires, then came the virus. And the future for travel agents. Will we need them now more than ever? We're going to have to know what is required when someone travels to Italy and then wants to go to Germany. Do they need a COVID test to get into Germany? One of the country's biggest earners was hit with twin crises early in 2020. Reeling from the catastrophic bushfires, coronavirus placed a sudden stop on the near $60 billion tourism sector. Visitors were locked up or locked out, pushing small businesses to the brink. The travel ban on Chinese tourists in particular saw operators dealing with the sharpest downturn in decades. Here's Stephanie Chalmers. Phones running hot, but not with new bookings for this Sydney travel agent. Instead, Jane Yuan is trying to help stranded customers who've had their flights from Beijing and Shanghai cancelled. Everyone is frustrated. Yeah, I just spoke to quite a staff. They are very frustrated as well because they don't know what's going to happen. Inbound Chinese tourists are the bread and butter of Jane's business. But Chinese and Australian government travel restrictions to contain the coronavirus outbreak have seen that rapidly dry up. For our tour groups, I cancelled my restaurant bookings. I cancelled my hotel bookings. The New South Wales Blue Mountains is an iconic destination. Already reeling from a horror summer, travellers grounded by the coronavirus are a further blow. There's a few operators who certainly are involved directly with the Chinese market, such as Scenic World, and they have had immediate cancellations for group business going forward. From an international tourism perspective for many businesses, I think this is already a crisis situation. Tourism accounts for around 3% of Australia's GDP and international travellers are worth around $40 billion to the economy. But the impact is much broader than that. Tourism employs 5% of the workforce, or more than 660,000 people, and generates business in sectors from food and retail to transport and accommodation. Of the 9.3 million tourists that visit Australia, 1.4 million are from China, spending an average of $9,000 per trip for a total spend of $12.3 billion. When we're not getting any Chinese visitors virtually, uh, that's a very substantial impact every month and for as long as this goes on and potentially even after. ABC's Maggie Rooley is on the fire line in New South Wales. Images beamed across the world elicited sympathy and donations, but discouraged holidaymakers. Jason Cronshaw normally has six hop-on, hop-off buses on the roads over the December-January peak. But this summer, he ran just one. Unfortunately, we've had to make some redundancies already. All our casual staff haven't really had any shifts over the period of time. In 45 years, I have never seen any thought of downturn like this. Several businesses in the Blue Mountains towns of Lura, Katoomba and Blackheath have already closed and Jason fears they won't be the last. On the fire-ravaged south coast of New South Wales, businesses are facing the same grim reality. At this time of year, this caravan park would normally be absolutely packed. But right now there's vacant lots where people have decided not to come on their usual holidays. And on New Year's Eve, this park had to evacuate 1,500 guests and had them all out by 5 p.m. You can see how close it's come here. Absolutely. I mean, as you can see, it's burnt all through this side of the park. Grant Wilkins runs the Gaday Group, which evacuated 5,000 people across six parks. The business is counting itself lucky that with 280 parks across the country, it can absorb the impact of the summer disaster. The good news is there'll be another January. It's going to come again next year. But the reality is a lot of the smaller businesses, this is the one month where they make most of their money. We've just done the figures and yeah, we've lost 60% of our yearly income. So. Yeah. Nicole McDonald's business managing holiday rentals has refunded tens of thousands of dollars. Government support is available in the form of an interest-free loan, but she's reluctant to take up the offer. I definitely wouldn't be taking on extra debt with no guarantee of people booking for the future. 
um, it's definitely, definitely wouldn't be doing that. As Nicole waits for domestic tourists to return, it's too early for Jane Yuan to think about the return of international visitors. If this issue is carried on for another two to three months, a lot of business, business like ours will probably facing a shutdown kind of crisis. With coronavirus cases hitting 37,000, the stricken tourism industry could see a lot more sites like this one. Steph Chalmers there. Well, from empty buses to empty planes, Australia's international airports have been our gateway to the world, so they've been the most obvious example of the travel shutdown. In Sydney, bustling car parks, shops and restaurants have stood empty as flights trickled to the barest minimum. In the space of one month, we went from being the beating heart of the city to a ghost town. It's devastating. I look around and I, I see how quiet we are. And for me, that's the face of the tourism industry. This is Australia's busiest airport like you've never seen it before. The normal hustle and bustle has been replaced by an eerie emptiness. We were handling a thousand flights a day. We're now doing 10 flights a day, 20 if we're lucky. 150,000 people were coming through the airport every day. We're now seeing 100, 200 people a day. These travellers are waiting in the International Departures Hall more than 10 hours before their flight. But it's not to beat the queues. There are no queues. This is travel in the time of coronavirus. We have the mask and the gloves and we hope that not, nothing happened, nothing bad happened to us. Unai and Susanna are returning to Spain after a nine-month working holiday. Their first flight a fortnight ago was cancelled and they first left South Australia four days ago. They expect to arrive in Valencia after around 30 hours travel. Our family don't know. They don't know that we are coming back, so yeah, it's a surprise. surprise. But <laughs> difficult surprise. <laughs> It's a completely different experience for travellers. Number one, there's just no one here at the airport. You can't get into the airport unless you have a ticket. All of the retail shops are closed. All the food shops are closed. Across in the domestic terminal, Mark Nixon is closing up. This time of day, we'd probably have about 100, 100 to 120 customers. Um, we trade from 6.30 in the morning till 10 p.m. at night and um, pretty flat out. Mark reopened a few weeks ago once restrictions eased, allowing up to 10 people in restaurants. There's no foot traffic, um, there's no atmosphere, there's no people. All these shops used to be open, people everywhere, really good vibe. Now there's, there's almost nothing. More than 33,000 people normally work here at their airport alone. Across the country, the tourism industry employs more than 600,000. And with few passengers passing through here, that means little work, with many stood down or out of a job. Out on the airfield, some planes are still moving. Parcels that are normally packed into the cargo holds of commercial flights are now being loaded in the cabins of empty aircraft. Repatriation flights from around the world have seen airlines that don't usually operate commercial services to Australia landing again. Myanmar was in just a couple of days ago. We've had a few Saudi Arabian flights as well. Uh, we even had uh, flights like Austrian and, and KLM come in and we haven't seen Austrian for 13 years. We haven't seen KLM for a bit longer than that. Nigel's worked through major events, including 9-11 and the collapse of ANSET. He's never seen so many planes parked on the runways and taxiways. Qantas, Jetstar and Virgin aircraft sit idle, their wheels wrapped in plastic, their engines covered. But there are some signs of life, as Qantas increases its domestic capacity and restrictions ease, allowing some interstate travel. There's a general feeling around the place that things are starting to pick up a little bit now just from interactions I've had with some of the, the ground crews here. So fingers crossed, you know, the brakes get released soon. We're really hopeful that domestic opens up for the, the July school holidays. And then we're also really hopeful about travel to New Zealand under the Trans-Tasman bubble. But for now, the pickup is yet to occur. It's the uncertainty that's the issue for me. It's not so much having to go through what we've just gone through. I don't know how long this is going to stretch out for, and even financially, 
let's get to the point I'm on JobKeeper myself. Um, and the long, and the, if this keeps going and going and going, um, it's, it's going to get tougher and tougher. The gateway to Australia's tourism sector, still a ghost town. The months of closed borders sent thousands of travel agents packing. Many were forced to close or downsize. And as international travel remains off the table, more are set to go. But as Nassim Kadem reports, their survival could be crucial when international borders reopen. Miriam Henry was on a five-month travel adventure when she fell sick in late March while in the UK. About a week out from coming home, I started to get a small cough, which I thought was something I normally get in the winter. Confirmed as COVID-19, Miriam's travel agent, Linda, quickly organised her flight back home. For me, it's been extremely stressful. Um, I thank Linda very much for making me come home because I'm actually quite worried what would have happened to me had I been still in the England. Linda runs a mobile travel service from her home on the Mornington Peninsula. She relies on international travel bookings, so she's had to place her business in hibernation while she looks for another job. Many others have been unable to survive. They've already left. I mean, people who have been in the industry since school, they're, they've been in the industry 10, 20, 30, even 40 years. Yes, isn't yes, beautiful? beautiful, love that. It's not just leisure travel that's been impacted. Penny Spencer runs a corporate travel agency in Sydney. She's had to close two shop fronts and run her business out of head office in Mascot. Pretty much overnight, uh, our business stopped. We had nothing to sell. So we were like a supermarket with nothing on their shelves. She says thanks to her bank and JobKeeper, they're surviving. But if interstate travel doesn't start up again soon, they're in trouble. Every day I wake up and think, what is today going to bring? Whether it's going to be another shutdown of a border or hopefully an opening of a border. Uh, you know, mentally it does take a toll on you. A recent survey by the Small Business Ombudsman found that travel agents are barely surviving. Nearly all of them saw revenue plunge when COVID restrictions were introduced in March. And with travellers cancelling bookings and asking for refunds, travel agents lost their commissions and the cash dried up. ASX listed companies like Flight Centre can still go to the market for extra cash, but it's also taken a huge hit, having to close more than 500 stores in Australia since the crisis. We've had a significant downsizing and obviously the staff to go with that as well. We've lost, lost about 66% uh, of our frontline staff. Mr Turner says it'll take until June 2025 to get back to what they were earning before the pandemic. And while many small businesses will go under, once international travel resumes, the role of agents will be even more crucial. I think it will reinforce the fact that, uh, you know, you, you need a good travel agent in this sort of time to make sure that, that your travel is safe. We're going to have to know what is required when someone travels to Italy and then wants to go to Germany. Do they need a COVID test to get into Germany? Linda Foster says they need JobKeeper extended to survive the next few months. We've been through crises before, um, you know, in the world. We've had ANSET, we've had SARS, we've had the GFC, we've also had 9-11. Um, we've never asked the government for help. Um, but now we really need the help. If she survives, she can help client Miriam Henry off on her next journey. I'm definitely going to go to back to a few places of my f big tour that I was on. Her agent will be the one to help navigate a whole new world of travel post-COVID. Well, as passports lie idle, Australians are now facing the relaxed state border restrictions to explore our own backyards. While you're doing that, the business is also on a break, but our reporters are bringing you all the business and economics news you need online over summer. Just head to the ABC News website and click on the business page. And we look forward to seeing you when we return on Feb 1. I'm Elise Morgan. Thanks for watching.